Welcome to the Black Girls Heal podcast, where we talk about changing unavailable relationship patterns, healing unresolved trauma, and building a healthy relationship with first you and then others. Every episode, we will talk about actionable advice that you can apply today to break unhealthy patterns and grow your self-worth. I'm Sheena Tubbs. Let's begin. Hello, hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Black Girls Heal. It is my favorite time of year. Well, my second favorite. Um, If you're just now joining the podcast, um, you don't know that Valentine's Day is actually my second favorite holiday after Christmas. And I have recently reclaimed it um, instead of feeling like I had to hate it. But I love Valentine's Day. I love the ability to tell people who I love that I love them and to practice healthy connection. And so if Valentine's Day is triggering to you, this is the perfect podcast because that probably means that there are some conflicts or some issues or some unmet needs or things that you're needing that um, having a holiday that talks about relationships and connection um, brings up a lot of pain. And that's totally valid and it makes sense. And um, you are totally entitled to have the feelings that you have. And I want you to get to a place to where there is not a time of year that invokes pain, that invokes stress, that invokes low self-worth or bitterness, right? Um, For you to be able to have the power to take back whatever has been taken from you, to be able to reframe a day or a time period in your life for one that has meaning, that has purpose, that has strength, that is actually a cue for you to have self-love and empowerment um, and not contrary to... um, And not in a way that's like defensive. So I don't care what society says Valentine's Day should be. I'm going to make it this. Um, Even that has a lot of um, negative energy in it, right? Versus like, this is a time that I can just call for beauty and connection to the people who matter to me, to the people who, to the relationships that I want to cultivate, to the things I want to feed. Because I want you to remember that whatever you feed will grow. If you feed bitterness, if you feed resentment, if you feed unforgiveness, if you feed negativity, that is what's going to grow in your life. If you feed positive mindset, if you feed the fact that you are built for abundance, if you feed the fact that you are worthy and deserving of all love, connection, and um, and all the things that you desire, then that is what will grow in your life. And so I encourage you to have that reframe this holiday season um, because it is still the holiday season, (laughs) y'all. Valentine's Day, I feel like, ends the holiday season. At least it does for me. Um, um, So, yeah. So that is my wish for you before we get started um, for this episode. And y'all, with this being Black Girls Heal Birthday Month, I also launched, relaunched this podcast on Valentine's Day last year. Um, and so this is the Black Girls Hill podcast birthday month, which is another reason I'm really stoked. Um, my, my hope one day is for us to have an annual conference or workshop around Valentine's Day. Um, that's just my dream. And I'm putting that out there for it to happen one day. It might even happen next year. Who knows? Um, but it is our birthday month. And one exciting thing is coming out this birthday month, which is the recovery school. And so I talked about this before. I've talked about how I've had a gajillion different things that I've taught in regards to healing our self-love, to healing our relationships for women who are single, for women who are partner, for women who are in situationships, for women who um, are in all of those things and just want to focus on their self-love. And it's just been... um, it can be, it's been a lot and it's been hard to kind of, um, for even me as the creator to tell you, so here are the things that I offered to you. Um, 
And so I have put them all together into a membership platform. So not a course, a membership that you can join um, and get what you need and come and get coached and come and get supported and get access to all of the things that I teach around healing unresolved trauma, around building connection, whether or not you need to unlearn un unhealthy ways to attach if you're constantly attracting or being attracted to unavailable people and learning how to date and learning how to actually do these detoxes because many of y'all have done three months, six months, year long detoxes, years long detoxes and focus on your kids, focus on your careers, focus on whatever else. And then you go back to dating and being in relationships and it's all still the same. And you're like, I don't understand why. I know why. And I help women break those actual cycles in a way that actually works. Um, and then I help women who have finally gotten those relationships, found their partners, learned how to connect um, or wanting to connect and actually help them learn how to connect. Because even when you meet the man or the woman that you've been wanting to be with, that doesn't make it any easier for you to be intimate. If anything, that makes it more scary. It makes you can be um, scared to share with what you need to have your wants um, listened to and to have someone who's listening to them and attentive to you can be very, um, very scary at times. And also you can push it away. Um, and so in the recovery school, I am helping women in all those areas and healing the roots that make us battle with our self-worth to unlearn the negative boundaries, um, and ways that we might even regress as grown adult women when we are around our families. Like I'm doing it all, anything related to self-love and breaking unhealthy relationships and building healthy relationships is all in the recovery school. And so that will be launching this month. I cannot wait. Cannot wait. Um, so if you have, um, if you are a new follower, a new listener, and you have tried to sign up for, um, the roadmap or the masterclass, I'm pretty sure I've redirected all the links to where you can't even get to those things right now. But if you somehow found the link and you put your email address in and you haven't gotten the email, it's because I shut it down because I want to make sure that all the focus is on the recovery school, that you're not getting any kind of invitations that say, Hey, join, learn to thrive or join the healed and loved woman. Cause those things, um, are not available anymore on their own. They are all within the membership, um, for you to have full access to whenever you need it. So, so excited for that. Um, and all the healing that that is going to bring for women to be able to kind of have a smorgasbord, to have a buffet. And what I love about this new platform that I'm using for the membership is that there are actual roadmaps. So depending on what you're coming in for, whether or not you're coming in because you've had toxic friendships and you're like, I'm tired of having bitterness and not having people in my circle. Um, but I'm also afraid of trust. Then it's like, okay, do this course, do this course and do this course and come and show up and talk about these things. Um, if it's about the dating stuff, then do this and do this. If you're in a marriage or long-term partnership, then do this lesson, this lesson, and this lesson. And I love checklists. I love having systems. I love having processes. I love when things are really cute too. The platform is super cute. Um, I've had, um, a couple of women, um, transfer already over. Some of my students are already transfer over. And one was like, it looks so good. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> So I, I love, I just, I'm so excited for y'all to see it. So that is coming soon. You can get on the wait list by going to blackgirlsheal.org slash school, or click the link in our show notes. If you're listening to this podcast on your, uh, on your podcast player, be it iTunes or Spotify or whatever else. And speaking of clicking on links and bios, I want to say thank you so much to all of the women who submitted the sex survey. So our last podcast, um, yes, it was our last podcast was about sex as an attachment issue. And I was talking about all the ways that, um, issues with our attachment can show up in our sex life or our lack of sex life. And I asked for women who were willing to participate to elaborate more on the things that I talked about or to share things that maybe I didn't cover um, that you feel like might be related to your own unresolved attachments um, or insecure attachment patterns or um, unresolved trauma, um, 
to see if I can provide more support um, and more materials around it. There is already, um, um, it's called the Good Sex Academy. <laughs> and so that is already a course that is inside of our membership. When I tell you y'all, everything related to intimacy, attachment, healing, and connection, friendship, all of that is within this membership. It's there. Um, and it is not just a whole bunch of worksheets. Like it is really great. I'm very, very proud of it. Um, but all that said for me to, um, really hit all of those pain points that you may be experiencing, um, me wanting to do that more in 2020. Um, it probably won't be until later this year, um, perhaps, or maybe even later this spring when it shows up on the podcast itself, but, uh, materials will be more readily available in the membership for sure. But thank you so much to all of you who were vulnerable and shared with me some of the things that have been going on with you. Um, those of you who are everything from single, very, very single, um, and still battling with like fantasy and porn and the things that you feel like have been distancing you from connecting to yourself and other people, to those of you who are in partnerships and also struggle with those same things, to those of you who battle with religious shame, um, those of you who struggle with telling your partner what you want or staying present um, because you're not used to having needs and having desires. And this is even no matter what your body count is, right? I just, I just really appreciate all of your feedback on your vulnerability. And my hope is to give you really great, applicable, practical, supportive tools that actually help you break free and help you heal because we are full sexual beings. Our sexuality is a gift. It is a gift from God. Um, we all have clits. We all have um, desire. We all have wants to be connected and to be loved and to be seen. And our sexual expression is just a much, as much a part of it. Um, and I want you to experience that. And for those women who may have had struggles, um, or medical issues with your clitori, and, um, even if there's anyone listening to me who's experienced female genital mutilation or anything like that, like I want to be able to provide things for all of us, um, to help us reclaim things that have been taken from us or things that have always been there, but no one told us or gave us permission to claim our birthright. And for you to just know, you ain't, you don't need no permission, girl. You, you, this is yours, right? So there's that. That's all the announcements for today. Let's jump into this podcast episode. Um, so the title of it is maybe it's you. So, uh, let me tell you, where this comes from. So I have noticed, um, and I, and I've noticed this for a while, but it has been a resurgence lately where I have seen a lot of people, um, and had interactions with a lot of people who have, um, been having persistent relationship issues and not just romantic. Um, primarily, usually it's, um, it's actually friendship wise or peer level wise, but it's pretty much across the board. But having these persistent relationship issues and just being so frustrated um, and feeling so hopeless and overwhelmed about and feeling so lonely when it's like I'm trying really hard to be there and be open and be available, but people keep letting me down. And so I talk a lot, obviously, on this podcast about people around us who are unavailable and spotting issues with other people and signs that someone is toxic for you. And so the, the problem that you're having these, these issues with people is because you're attracting people who are unavailable. They might be nice people, but they're not able to give you what you need in a relationship. But what this episode is about is maybe it's not that you are attracting unavailable, unavailable people, but maybe you are the one that, that that's the issue. Maybe you being the common denominator is something that you are bringing or not bringing into the relationship. That is the reason why people keep letting you down. And maybe it's not that people are actually letting you down, but maybe it's that you're projecting things onto other people that really is not based on fact, but maybe it's based on feeling. It's based on unresolved trauma. 
and you've unfairly mm-hmm. put the responsibility for them to fix it, to make you feel better, to make you feel safe on them when really it's up to you and it's up to you to change your mindset about it. Here's the reason why it's hard for us to do that. It's hard for us to do that because the ways that we feel and the ways that we think, especially when it's connected to our own pain and expect, especially when it's connected to our own emotional safety. And especially when we have had a history of, um, men, women, parents, caregivers, fake friends, real friends, hurting us, abandoning us, we can get extra grounded in the thought that if I see or experience this pain, then it must be true. And all the meaning and the, and the facts that I have around it, the things that I'm calling facts must be truth. And other people are the ones that need to change, right? So there's a belief that I'm seeing everything crystal clearly. I see exactly what's going on. And because of that, I'm going to react accordingly. Um, and because it's all based on a place of self-protection, um, our bodies, our minds, our spirits are not wanting us to continue to be hurt. And so we react very viscerally to it. And we, um, immediately can create boundaries, create walls and create beliefs about the intentions about what the other person is doing, why they did what they're doing. Um, what they're going to do next. And then also we can change our perspective about the other person. And sometimes that is good. I spent a lot of times, um, I spent a lot of time, especially in this podcast and also with my coaching students, trying to teach you and build confidence and trusting your gut. So many of us have cut off our connection to our, our inner inner voice, our instinct, our inner child, our subconscious, um, the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to um, name it, we have cut off our connection to those things because we're afraid that we're afraid to use our voice. And so that's one thing. However, sometimes it's not our inner voice and our instinct that's talking to us. It's our old pain. It's our old wounding. And because they both come from a deep inner place, they can feel the same, but it's only through growth and maturity and healing that we can get to a place to where we can learn the difference between the two. And the only way that we can learn the difference between the two is by taking our pain and you can't see me, but it's it's as if I'm holding it in my hand and I have it, I have my hand in front of my face and I'm looking at it. And so for us to examine our pain and to say, okay, Where is this coming from? Is my pain valid? Could there be another reason that things like this may be happening or that this could have happened and examining our facts and where the source comes from and what to do next? Sometimes that can be scary, especially if we come so far in our healing process, the idea of like, okay, so now I got to look at my pain and see if it's valid. That sounds very much like the same thing that people used to do before us, especially if we've had narcissists in our past. We've had, if we've had narcissists in our past, we have constantly been fighting and been told that our pain is not valid, that we are oversensitive, that we are just making things, things up, um, that we don't have a right to feel the, the way that we feel. And even if we don't, haven't had narcissists, if we've had parents or caregivers who've been overbearing, if we've had an argumentative um, or emotionally withdrawn family, any reason, it, it could be any trauma actually, where we have learned that what we feel and what we need is not as important to other people. The idea of looking at my pain and deciding if it's valid or not feels like almost as if you could be re-traumatizing yourself. But here's the thing. If you are actually looking at your facts and able to take in the truth plus your wounding plus what has actually happened with the other person by you examining it that actually what doesn't take away the validity of your pain if anything if it's not based in projection if it's not based on you putting your stuff onto other people it actually makes your pain more um this is the best word i have right now in this moment but more legitimate 
it makes it more base in truth because look, I've actually looked at this neutrally. I've like looked to see if there's any place that I could be wrong. And now nah, this stands, this stands true. This is still real. Right. Um, and again, especially if we've been, um, we have a history of people taking advantage of us and not listening to us. The idea of being introspective almost feels as if we're giving people a one over on us, right? So I've worked so hard for me to be able to take care of me and to stand up for me. The last thing I want to do is to give you reason to think that I might be wrong or for me to feel good about myself and for me to feel protected, I have to be right in this situation. So even if I'm a little bit wrong, I'm not going to let you know that I'm wrong and I'm going to hold on to what's been going on as long as I can. Um, because if I let this go, then that means something negative about me or my self-worth, which again is projection. Okay. So there's a word that is used in the therapy world. It's called transference. Um, and typically it happens with, um, is used within therapy, but it's whenever you can transfer your own feelings about your parents, care, caregivers and traumas onto another person. Again, because we use this word, word in the therapy world a lot, typically on your therapist. And so this is where you can start to transfer both positive and negative feelings about um, parents and caregivers. So this is where you might start to see your therapist as your mother or like your father in either a good or a bad way. You can start to see them as your sister. Um, I can say that me personally for a long time, I had a problem um, seeing women who were a certain age older than me um, and they looked a certain way and they talked a certain way because, um, I would see them as my mother, um, and in a, in a good way. And it got really tough, especially when my mother first passed away. And it was a problem because if I'm seeing you as, and this is me, this is called counter transference when it's a therapist, um, who's, who's transferring her feelings onto a client. So it stopped me from being able to do my job correctly, you know, because if I need to challenge her, if I need to um, give her feedback, and if me, in that case, I'm thinking of some specific situations, if I feel a desire to protect or to nurture or to be kind, then I can do all those things as a therapist, but it might stop me from telling you the truth. I might, I might actually, in the way I need to tell it to you, if that makes sense. I may want to sugarcoat it a little bit more is what I'm saying, because I have my own counter transference issues that I need to work through. And so this podcast episode is talking more about negative transference, right? So the time, anytime that you put negative feelings onto other people, um, that inhibits the relationship. So here are some ways that you can put transference onto other people, not just your therapist. I was just using that as an example, but put transfer, transfer your feelings and project your feelings onto other people. You can transfer and project your own personal faults onto other people and your, um, your irritation with your own personal issues onto other folks. You can transfer your trauma onto other people. You can transfer your fear of rejection onto other people. So you anticipating that they're going to reject you before they actually do anticipating that they are thinking something negative about you. Um, this is you transferring your own negative self-worth onto other people. You can transfer your own fear of commitment onto other people. So looking for ways that they may leave you or abandon you. This can also look like you looking for exits in the relationship. So everything is going really great. You're starting to get closer and all of a sudden, um, they really start to get on your nerves and you start to look for, um, reasons that, um, it makes sense to leave. I mean, this might look really f familiar to you on both sides of the equation. So if you've ever been in a relationship where it just felt like someone was picking a fight with you just to pick a fight, just to create some distance or you yourself, you knew you were picking a fight with someone just because things were getting a little bit close, a little bit too intimate. Maybe you don't even have, you didn't have words for it at the time, but maybe that I'm saying it out loud or maybe in hindsight, especially if that relationship is no longer 
around and you might be having kind of like some feelings of like regret around it. Um, that's what was going on. You're projecting your own fear that this is not going to last, that this is too good to be true. Her and I are too close as girlfriends. She's going to end up stabbing me in the back anyway. So let me go ahead and like make this fight right now. That's what was going on. Related to um, female friendships, I, I often see this with those of us who had who had narcissistic mothers. So those of us women who had narcissistic mothers, it's very hard for us to be objective in female relationships unless we've like really been very intentional and very um, mindful of our own stuff because our first relationship with the woman, our main relationship with the woman was so abusive, um, was so invalidating. And so any kind of trigger around that fact um, really escalates it. Um, so something that might be a minor wound, like, or a minor inconvenience, like if, if my coworker, John says something to me that like was a little bit annoying, if my coworker, Sharon says it, um, or my best friend Felicia says it, um, or even my therapist Mary says it because as a woman, it can be a lot more intensified. And that is the projection. That's the transference that I mean. And to be clear, what I mean by feelings being intensified is that person going from being your favorite person who you get along with, who you trust with everything. And now they are just like your mother. They're negative, they're abusive, they're critical, and it completely erases the whole history of who that person is. And this is such a common problem because when we project, when we transfer our feelings, we start to treat people as if they are the abusers from our past. Uh, we start to lump everybody together and we forget the nuance. We go into our trauma stance, we go into our protective stance, and that person immediately becomes our enemy. And again, we discount the full nature and history of the relationship. And when that happens, because the truth is, as long as you are in relationship with people, you are at risk of being hurt. People are imperfect. They forget things. They misspeak. Um, they lose track of time. They um, misspend money. Like just whatever it may be, whatever your trigger may be, it it may, well, not it may, it will happen. You will be triggered in relationships. And if we get to a place to where we are, or when, if we are in a place where we are so sensitive to our triggers and we don't have awareness about it, um, to where we don't catch it, we can get into a place to where we villainize people around us, even those who are healthy and good for us. Um, and we end up being alone and we wonder why we are consistently alone. Um, and again, we may be the common denominator and just quickly to circle back before I go to the next point. Um, I talked about how, um, there's a possibility of having good transference feelings. I'm doing like the air quotes that you can't see, but good transference feelings. Um, good transference the example I gave for me, yes, they were positive feelings, but they were affecting our relationship negatively. And so to help some of you, um, who may have your own therapist, the way that transference could look like for you is if you start to see them as your mother or your father. Now, when they give you feedback, you can have this, um, really intense need to impress them, to make them proud, um, fear of disappointing them, fear of, or really wanting them to like you. And it could be because you really love your therapist, but it could also be that some of your old, your own family trauma and family issues are getting wrapped up into that. And so that need to be like that need to get approval is more reminiscent of your own family issues and that need to have your father's approval or your mother's approval or the acceptance around them more than your actual therapist. And again, this could be in all areas of your life. It could be um, with bosses, it could be with coworkers, it could be with friends, basically us treating other people in the ways that we wanted other people to treat us or assigning them the responsibility to fix the wounds that other people left in their place. So I'm kind of rolling into the next part that I want to talk about is how can you tell if this is you versus this is like a real, um, and I hate to, 
I hate to keep saying the word legitimate because so many of us have been fighting for legitimacy in our feelings. And I, and I don't want to inadvertently give you language to start to invalidate yourself for you to go into every situation that now you've gained confidence in and for you to be like, well, maybe I shouldn't feel this way. That's not my intention. Um, so hopefully by me giving you these steps, it will help you. Um, it'll help you do both to help you be able to have confidence in what you feel. And also times that you might be projecting things onto other people. That's not fair to do. So you'll be able to rein that in, heal what you need to and repair the relationship. So ways that you can tell if it's you is first to see if the wounding or the conflict that you're having with this person doesn't line up with facts about the relationship. So has this relationship with this person traditionally been nurturing, kind? Have they been receptive? Have they been available to you? Have they been loving to you? Have they been supportive of you? And if so, does this incident, does it line up with the facts of it? So if that's the case, either two things could be true. It could be true if this person has been emotionally available and really good to you and healthy towards you. Um, it could be that what you think happened did not happen. Um, so sometimes we can be so sensitive to our triggers that anything that looks like smells like could be like a trigger. We hop to assigning it that label. Like, so maybe we misheard what they said. Maybe we misunderstood what they said. Maybe we were already sensitive going into a conversation or going to an event where we were hanging out and we were already kind of activated and hype. And so we were looking for a reason to put our shell on to react the way that we needed to react. Um, and so what we think that person said or did didn't actually happen. Or maybe this kind, loving, open person towards you did say or do something that was triggering or hurtful to you. But like I just said, because it's connected to a deeper trauma, it got bigger than what actually called for the situation. And so the next thing that I want you to assess for you to tell if it's you or not, after you assess this, this issue line up with the facts of the relationship is does your response level match the level of the offense? I've said this phrase before on this podcast, but if your reaction is hysterical, then it's historical. And um, hysterical does not need to mean that you're throwing a full out tantrum, that you're cussing them out, that you're like going ballistic, which it could totally be that that's kind of your response. But it could also be that you immediately cut them off. That again, you sign that, you know, I never really trusted them in the first place or they're not there for me. And you completely discount the relationship history and you lose a friend or you lose a boyfriend or you lose a wife or you lose a husband or you lose a relationship with a parent because you are so into your feelings. Um, and it's hard for you to, um, ob objectively see what's going on. In addition to cutting them off, kind of going ghost for a little bit and doing the silent treatment. Um, and then, then what's really interesting about that is we do the silent treatment while we're secretly wanting the other person to come and apologize and say, I'm sorry. But especially if they, if it didn't happen in the first place, if you're projecting something that, ha that happened, that didn't happen, or if it was something so small um, and y'all have had a pretty cohesive, kind, like open relationship, this person's not even going to know to come and apologize. They're not mind readers. There's nobody in this world that's a mind reader that I know of. Um, so you're not going to get that apology, which makes you even more upset and makes you even more resolute that even if you do start talking to them again, you're like, you've already created this narrative in your head about who they are, which is even more so not based on facts, which creates more distance. So that means the next time you're triggered, which means you're most likely going to get triggered even quicker and faster, which is going to dissolve this relationship even more all because you didn't communicate what you needed, which is number three. The third way that you can tell if this is you is to ask, did I communicate my feelings within the trigger or within whatever happened. Right. And so communicating your feelings is exactly what that sounds like. Is you saying, I felt fill in the blank when this happened, you making assumptions about what's going on, 
You saying, well, I just need some space right now. You saying I'm just busy right now. It's not communicating to the other person that your feelings were hurt, um, that you were triggered, that um, you've been feeling upset or whatever, right? Um, you're not able to resolve the relationship that way. And so that ownership is on you. It'll be different if you had communicated what you needed and the person was dismissive, blew you off, projected or blame shifted it or gaslighted you. But if that didn't happen, then uh, we got to look at what, what basis you're standing on. So with all that said, what you need to do is to identify what your feelings are. You need to process and look at if they're actually about the person or if it's actually about you and line it up with what the truth is and this relationship. Um, and even if it is about you, you still need to communicate it. So many of us, when we are in pain, we only go back and forth between let me hold this in and deal with it myself or I'm going to go ghost or stonewall or avoid the issue at all. You have to practice getting out of your own mind and communicating and being intimate and close with somebody. So even if you've resolved it, you still need to tell them about it because you're learning how to be close and you're trying to help people learn to get to know you and see you. So with all that said, I know that um, this is really good info if I pat myself on the back. Um, but at the same time, um, getting past our own mental and emotional blocks is hard. And so that's why the recovery school is for, for years, I would read all the things I had to do. Even me, when I was fully in my therapist world with friends who were therapists and reading therapist books, it was still so hard for me to, to do this myself. And I'm paid and trained to do this. Right. Um, and I had access to other people in my world. And so, um, I have helped break down, this is how you do it and help. And I've pinpointed how to help coach women get over these heel, hills and hurdles themselves. So if these are things that you're like, all right, I've been trying to do this myself, sis, I need some extra support. I need to get some emotion coaching to get my emotions in check. I need to be able to figure out um, where these roots come from. I need to learn how to identify healthy friendships in the first place. I need to know what to expect from my partner in the second place. Um, I need to know how to not project my family stuff onto other people and to also validate myself and still feel loved. I have things for every single one of those issues plus more in the recovery school. So I want you to join. I want you to come. I want you to get healed and I want you to get your life changed. Um, again, you can find more information about the recovery school at blackgirlsheal.org slash school. It will be open all year round. We don't have to worry about doors closing. Um, there will be special offers for those who decide to join um, when they first come and get initiated. Um, but it is open all year round for women to be able to change their lives whenever they need. So blackgirlsheal.org slash school. And that is it for this episode. I hope you found it helpful. Go ahead and tag me on Instagram at blackgirlsheal underscore. If you enjoyed this podcast episode and continue the conversation with me in our free Facebook group at blackgirlsheal.org slash. That's it for this week. Y'all take care of yourselves.